Welcome to History by the Month! In this episode, we shine a light on events in black history that occurred in the month of February. And we'll begin with a seminal event in America's civil rights movement that occurred on the very first day of February. February 1, 1960. The civil rights sit-in movement begins when four young African-American students, Ezell Blair Jr., David Richmond, Franklin McCain, and Joseph McNeil, sit at a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. The young men were students at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College, and they had planned their protests very carefully and enlisted the help of a local white businessman, Ralph Johns, as well. The young man entered Woolworths, sat down at the lunch counter, ordered, were denied service, refused to get up, and the police were called, but unable to do anything because of a lack of provocation. While the young men were sitting there, Johns sprang into action and called the local media. Television coverage arrived and covered the event as the young man sat at the lunch counter for the rest of the day and continued sitting when they returned the next day. That television coverage would make a huge difference as we learn from three individuals who remember it very well. Students in Greensboro sitting on those stools and letting people put hot coffee on them and put the cigarettes on the neck. And they didn't move. They just sat there. So, wow, this is something. This is something. And so I said, I want to be a part of this. And that's when I got involved in the movement. Went to all kind of rallies and meetings and school meetings and political meetings where you get uh, to use your head to think. You listen and learn. I just admired those people for having the grit, having the, taking all of that punishment. The students at the lunch counter, they had some of that in Houston, in Texas Southern College. And the, the, the young men would go sit on the counters and they'd sit there all day and nobody served them and nobody said a word and they'd sit there. So some of the citizens would prepare food and take it there for them to eat. We started taking individual groups. We'd do the movies, we'd do the theaters, we'd do the publishing companies, we'd do the bottling companies. I mean, we just went A, B, C, D until everything now is integrated. By February 5, some 300 students had joined the protests at Woolworths, and heavy television coverage quickly spread the movement nationwide, as diverse young people across the South and in the North began various forms of peaceful protests against segregation at public beaches and hotels, restaurants, all sorts of establishments. By the end of March 1960, the movement had spread to 55 cities in 13 states, and by the summer of 1960, restaurants across the South quietly began to be integrated. At the end of July, while most college students were still on summer vacation, the Greensboro Woolworths integrated its lunch counter as well. Four black Woolworths employees, Charles Best, Anitha Jones, Susie Morrison, and Geneva Tisdale, were the first four customers. History had been made. In the same decade, across the world in South Africa, discrimination occurred daily under the system known as apartheid. In 1964, as a result of his work with the African National Congress protesting apartheid, Nelson Mandela was imprisoned on Robben Island. It would not be until another event in February that he would be released. February 11th, 1990, Nelson Mandela is freed from prison. What was the system of apartheid like? Joel Smith Brown spent part of his youth growing up in South Africa. I had the opportunity to interview him a few years ago, and he shared some experiences and some memories of growing up under the system. You grew up in South Africa, mm -hmm. but you're not a native South African. I am not native. Uh, my parents are actually both British. Uh, my dad is from just outside of Manchester in a town called Worksop. Uh, my mother is actually from Sheffield, England. Uh, my parents immigrated to South Africa, which is very awkward, um, in 1981 to help fight apartheid. And you obviously lived under a sy the system of apartheid for how long? Until uh, I was nine. Give the students some description, some actual like um, examples of how that played out in your life. Um, 
It would be very similar to um, what America had in the sense of segregation and integration, uh, just on a, a quite a bit different level. Um, South Africa, it wasn't based on whether or not you were black or white. It was based on like how fair-skinned or how dark you were. So me being black, I would be a black person, and then you would have a colored person, um, and then you would have someone who was Indian, and then you would have someone who was Chinese and would be considered honorary white. Um, and what that did was there were basically certain places that you could go in town. Um, there were certain restaurants that you could eat at. Um, you could not go to school with people who were Indian or people who were Chinese or people who were white. Um, so the, the general basis of it was to keep the population as segregated as possible. Um, like the law stated that black people could not learn the language of white people, um, that you could not learn how to read English, things of that nature. Um, and it also stated that white people could not um, learn Swahili. Uh, interracial marriages were outlawed in, I think, like 1950. Um, if you were caught fraternizing with someone of a different uh, ethnicity uh, other than business, such as if they were your maid or they were your housemate, then you could be imprisoned. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, we were playing in a neighborhood and there was a maid who had just gotten off of work and she did not have a color card or what we would call like a pass book that told you like what your color category was and where you could go. She was taken away by the police. Well, they dragged her, they beat her, put her in the truck and took her away. Um, because she did not have a color card and she was in the wrong part of town. So you had to have that color card with you at all times? Yes. If you did not have your passbook, then you could be arrested at any point in time. Now, you've got an image you brought of some signage, I think? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so this that I'm bringing up here, this is for use by white persons. It says, now I notice the top of it's in English. Yes. The bottom language is this Afrikaans? That's Afrikaans. And the issue with this whole thing is that they did not teach you how to read English or Afrikaans. So if you were black and you were walking or you were colored or whatever, and you were walking through town to read this sign it would be impossible. So then the police would arrest you after that point because you did not know that this place was not, that, that you weren't allowed in this place because you couldn't read. And even the pass books were written in Afrikaans. So you did not know where you were allowed to go, where you were not allowed to go. Mm. Very insidious system. Yes. So, I mean, in, in retrospect, it was, it's very hard uh, to not get arrested unless you know someone who's very fair-skinned. Like for me, my father was very fair-skinned, so there were lots of things that I could get away with, you could say, because I would spend time with my father. Mandela's release, of course, led to widespread change in South Africa and the dismantling of apartheid. On December 10, 1993, Mandela and F.W. de Klerk received the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts and work in dismantling apartheid. And on May 10, 1994, Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as the president of the Republic of South Africa. History was made once again. A few months earlier, in that same year of 1994, history was made in the American South when the family of a civil rights leader finally received justice. February 5, 1994, Medgar Evers' murderer is convicted. Byron Della Beckwith was convicted of the murder of Medgar Evers over 30 years after the crime occurred. Evers had been gunned down in the driveway of his Jackson, Mississippi home on June 12, 1963, while his wife Murley and their three children were inside. As the first field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi, Evers had orchestrated and organized civil rights activities across the state. His daughter, Rena Evers Everett describes why he became active in the movement and shares childhood memories of her father and his funeral. He started at a very young age wanting to make sure that freedom was, was within reach and freedom was, was his and his family's. But what changed his thoughts was when he had a family member who walked down the street and was accosted. He wasn't taken, but the family friend, Mr. Tingles, was. And he was lynched. And lynching at that time was twofold. Lynching was to get rid of the person that they lynched, but also to give a message to others not to step over your line. And so they left him up hanging off of that tree with his bloody clothes stripped and put over the fence and double dared anyone to remove them 
so they could always walk past and remember what happened. That's what motivated him. And also going to World War II, going into the war, he was over in Normandy, and he got more freedoms in Normandy than he did when he came home. And when he came home, he tried to register to vote. And when he couldn't, and he was stopped at the courtyard steps with his brothers Charles with shotguns, that's what motivated and changed him. And he loved to watch cartoons with us. Uh, Rogue Runner was one favorite uh, because he liked the way that uh, the coyote kind of skipped out. And he, um, the other favorite was music and dancing. And one thing I will always hold dear is doing the twist with my dad. But more importantly, he always, always made sure that we understood what was going on around us. Um, he was a strategist. And so he made sure that we heard noises and understood what those sounds were. And let me just expand a little bit about that. One of the games that we played was where's the safest place in the house? And during that session of learning, he would ask us, and, and I say by us, my older brother, Daryl Kenyatta, and myself, uh, my younger brother, Van, was three years old, so it was a little young. But he would ask us, is that a backfire or a gunshot? And we would have to tell him which one it was and learn the difference. So um, he, we were taught how to defend ourselves and to always have your ears alert and the eyes in the back of your head. So you're looking all the time around at your surroundings and assessing the safety of you and your family. And during his, um, the first funeral in Jackson, which I remember only parts of it, but I do remember going out uh, the mortuary into the car and seeing 3,000, not knowing how many there were, but the mass of people marching after his death and the sign saying, after Medgar, no more fear. After Medgar, no more fear. Ms. Evers Everett carries on her father's legacy as executive director of the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute in Jackson, Mississippi. The organization is committed to strengthening communities throughout the United States through programming that supports increased civic engagement. To hear more memories from Ms. Evers Everett, check out our I Remember video with her. We end this episode of History by the Month by returning to the first day of the month, this time in 1978. February 1, 1978, Harriet Tubman becomes the first African-American woman to appear on a U.S. postage stamp. Named Araminta Ross when born into slavery, Harriet escaped to freedom in 1849 and returned over and over again to the South to free other slaves via the Underground Railroad. Glennis Brooks extensively researched Harriet's life to create her one-woman show, Harriet Tubman, an American Hero. Glennis let us film a performance and also shared what she learned about Miss Tubman's life as she researched it and why she believes Harriet's story matters to everyone. She is a lady that inspires all of us. She has a story and a voice and a path that we can look at and be inspired to become the best that we can be, to, to give our entire being and our entire heart to our calling, to our purpose, to what we love to do, to what helps contribute to the betterment of society, and then make the picture bigger than ourselves mm -hmm. and see how we can use our voice to help bring up the lives of others. Ooh, oh, oh. Freedom!
I got to do my best in every single way. I want to live out the freedom that I have today. I want to honor those who came before me, who fought and died for a life they couldn't see. Freedom! So the name of the show is called Harriet Tubman, an American Hero, and it falls under the category of a one-person show. So it's historical in content, and I play her life from age nine to 92. And I play all of the roles, all of the different stages that she goes through, and the characters that she interacts with. And even though you don't have to call nobody massa, and you can spend your money the way you want, you can't even vote. But when I looked at Harriet Tubman's story, well, I thought that that was a story that I knew just like everybody else always feels that they know. But when I started researching, I was really blown away by the incredible energy and strategy that was used through the Underground Railroad and how she succeeded. I have heard that you have made 19 trips secretly to free slaves. Is that true, Harriet Tubman? Oh yes, I freed about 300. We need trustworthy and loyal people like you, Harriet Tubman. Would you be She was the first woman in the military in the United States to create and lead a military campaign. Uh, through some of those, she freed like an additional 700 slaves. She really believed in her freedom. In fact, one of her quotes is that she felt that she had a right to two things, liberty and freedom or death. I think it's really timely because right now in the United States we hear a lot about division, specifically, you know, black and white. But in this story, I really saw how black people and white people really had to work vigorously together to free people through the Underground Railroad. And I, I felt like that's a really important story to tell. So that there is freedom and social justice for all. So she was always growing and redefining herself. And to me, that shows that we can continue to create for the rest of our lives. And that's how I want to be. A lot of it just starts to feel very real. Like a lot, a lot of her story just starts to feel real and powerful. And you see her as just so, you see her as so strong. I, I just want them to reach their full potential. I just want them to know that they can be and do what they want to do. One thing that the show ends with is she says that whether, whether you're born, born on this land, free, free or a slave, or a slave, I want you to keep the faith and remember this. Behind every great dream is a dreamer. And each of you here have the strength inside, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and change the world.